And I'm like, oh my God, I'm getting lucky on these things. And so I crawled out in the water, completely buck naked, by the way, took my waders off, went out and sat in the water. It was, I just couldn't lean over without filling my waders where the fish All were. Right. So I just got bucky and went out in the water. It's a summer, and, this is summertime, I imagine. Yeah, no, it's, <laughs> it's uh, late July. And so the water's, you know, still not, there's still plenty of shrinkage. It's cold. <laughs> but they, yeah. they, they, you get out there and it's like, oh, you know, but I'm watching, I'm watching, and I don't really figure it out. I'm looking like Dave did. That was Kelly Galp with another classic story going further than most people are willing to go for fish. This is episode 167 of the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. Welcome to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show, where you discover tips, tricks, and tools from the leading names in fly fishing today. We'll help you on your fly fishing journey with classic stories covering steelhead fishing, fly tying, and much more. Hey, how's it going today? Thanks for stopping by the Fly Fishing Show. Please share this episode if you get a chance today with one other person and help us continue to grow this podcast 100% organically. That'd be amazing if you could share it today with another person. Uh, Kelly Gallup is back for another round of the podcast today. Kelly's first episode from a couple of years back is still the leading podcast uh, for listens all time. Today, instead of uh, streamers, though, we're going to be digging into dry fly fishing. Kelly wrote the book on cripples and spinners back in the day, and today breaks out some tips and philosophies that I'm sure you definitely haven't been thinking about. So this is going to be uh, really good. Uh, I want to just jump right into it. So without further ado... Here is uh, Kelly Gout back again from SlideIn.com. How's it going, Kelly? Good, David. How you doing? Good, man. Good. This is uh, this is going to be good to jump back into it. I, I don't even have the episode number from what we did uh, a while back, but it's been at least a couple years, I think, where we recorded on on uh, streamers. So it's good. We're going to jump into dry flies if you're good with that today. Sweet. All right. Love it. Um, so we know, you know, I think we know your background. I'll, I'll put a link to the show notes in that past episode that talks about how you came out from the Midwest and, you know, made your way out uh, west, further west. But uh, how did the dry fly thing? Talk about how, how that got started and how long have you been doing that? Well, the dry fly thing is actually where I did get started. Um, if you go back and, when dinosaurs were still roaming <laughs> around uh, in the 70s, you know, the real – the real thrust of fly fishing started uh, actually in the 70s with Swisher and Richards doing selective trout and trout strategies. And it, it kind of was the first really big push, you know, where everything started uh, going to forefront. I mean, it's kind of where if you look at some of the greats out here, like Mike Lawson told me he got his, his start tying flies for Cal Gates on the Asable River in Michigan. Mm. And that's where Doug and Carl did uh, uh, selective trout trust strategies. I mean, they, they went all around doing it, but they, they were based out of Michigan. Uh, Doug was, uh, Doug Swisher was, a he was a chemist, I believe for Dow and Carl Richards was a dentist, uh, uh, in Rockford, Michigan. And so it was, it, you know, it all happened right by my house. Well, you know, 50 miles from my house, but, uh, it was, it was, I was a kid, but, you know, this is all happening and they do seminars over there and, and you, you'd see them around. It was just kind of the, it was the thing that just really got me going the whole streamer. And I mean, I, uh, my first probably 20 years was pretty much all dry fly because we were riding that selective trout thing, you know, the whole hatch matching and all of that. And that's, you know, that was all right there. And I was lucky enough. My mom would drive me over and once in a while I'd get to go over and see, the shop and you know when those guys were there and uh but and he showed and carl showed up once or twice to, to a time thing that i got to go and i just you know it was just that i was a i was a teenager and it was so it was pretty cool i got you know got and got to know there's another guy involved with that dave ellis who i think the probably the best he and carl were good buddies they both dentists went to uh, michigan dental school together and, and I got to know him young too, and it was pretty, and just just incredible dry fly guy. It was a different way of thinking, you know, because you're really when you came out of, until that dry fly fishing is pretty new. I mean, it's not that's a '30s game, you know. That's and it really it really wasn't that hmm. 
people didn't weren't they did detractors and stuff but mostly it was still i mean i grew up pretty much wet fly swing hmm. uh was you know european style wet fly stuff and i mean i, I think i told you before my dad was the first guy in the pure marquette mm-hmm. in 1940 um him and simi no just a couple way back when and you know mostly it was bigger wet flies you know cast of flies and run two or three at a time and and then you kind of had a joe brooks push things along and the flies started showing up but it really was more of a generic it wasn't the whole hatch matching and so when i got involved it was really selective you know trout was the thing and you know the, the no hackle craze and then matching the hatches and all that stuff and so that's what i did the first 15 20 years actually my first national fly was the troutsman hex which was the name of my shop back there and uh it was the only that was even before royalties that was in the early 80s and so and i think that was the only hex dry fly produced for man i think 10 or 15 years before somebody else, you know, and it's, it's got all, it was before we had royalties. So you, you really didn't worry about the name of the fly and all, you know, because you're not getting paid for it. And so we didn't put our names on them, but that fly was around. And that was, you know, that was a huge part of our life in the Midwest was that hex fly. I mean, that was, I would say 70% of the anglers back then, that's the only thing they did was that big mayfly. And so, and so anyway, and then, you know, our, our, that's just how, how it rolled. And so I, I think I told you before, I should have wrote cripples and spinners before I wrote modern streamers. Cause yep. I kind of got pigeonholed that I had a hell of a lot more experience fishing dries for until that book, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it kind of changed the world for me, yeah. but, uh, you know, it was a lot more, uh, I never really got out of it. Even here, I mean, I don't know how many. I think I have more, or at least as many national dry flies in nymphs as I do streamers. And but again, didn't put our names on a lot of them, or or didn't until royalties came along. We got paid per fly, and you needed your name attached to it. Uh, really didn't do that. But so that was probably the first twenty years of my life was of guide life was mostly dry fly. Hmm. And and it's interesting you mentioned the match the hatch. If you look at before, um, you know the the early. So you're saying kind of the the European. If you go way back, um, you're saying dry fly mm-hmm. fishing really got started in the 30s, 40s. It did, it doesn't go back yeah. too far. Not really. Not when it, not from a practical standpoint. If you look at it, it's really a Catskill thing. Uh, it's it's a it's really it's thrust came from i mean i've been there's been floating flies since i mean i've read stuff in the hues and yeah i mean in the 1600s i mean but in actuality i mean if you looked at people uh, other than the hex which i know that goes back into the four but at, they just weren't the they were there it just wasn't the forefront if you watch how it went from the 60s 50s you know, and, and part of this is wartime, you know, people weren't doing that. And I asked my dad once because I discovered that they put steelhead in the Pier Marquette or the Great Lakes, I mean, 11 years before they put steel, uh, brown trout in the U.S. And I remember asking him, how the hell could you not know? My grandparents owned the headwaters of the, the PM and, hmm. and my dad, that whole thing. And he's, you know, 1940 was his first year guiding there. I said, how could you not know we had steelhead? Hmm. And he said, well, we had this thing called a job back then. (laughs) (laughs) He said, said, people didn't recreate fly fishing like you know it today. He said, we fished. But he said, another thing was, you know, there was a lot of clear cutting in all the eastern states. There's a lot of a lot of, you know, dirty water in the spring and things like that. And so she, you know, didn't really think about it until that showed up later. And so basically, and in spring was harvest and planting and not harvest, but planting and, and getting things rolling again. And it just wasn't the same as it is today when there's a lot of leisure time. And so the dry fly thing, he, you know, listening to him, and, they were, and like I said, they're always there, but they're kind of general attractors. But, and that was, that was kind of a cool thing about fly time. If you go back into the 50s and 60s, every dry had a, a, a wet, counterpart huh. 
You know, if you had a, a, a whatever fly it was, if it was an Adams, for example, you had a dry Adams and a wet Adams. And, and then you always had male and female too. It was pretty cool. We kind of lost, we lost that part of it. We went into the just pretty much late seventies or mid to late seventies. You start watching this trend. Uh, you know, it's kind of like wet fly. Th- so when now it's like this new deal. Yeah. Well, that's how everybody fished in the old days. They, you know, and the dry fly was kind of a redheaded stepchild. It didn't play a lot of, huh. especially where we were. There were we didn't have the hatches that they had, and the West wasn't this big mecca of fly fishing mm-hmm. that it is now. It, you know, back it was an Eastern thing way more than it was out West, and. I mean, you didn't travel, but so it was, it was one of these things where the dry fly, it was there kind of in the background. If, if you ask me, at least from when, when, you know, where I fished and who I fished with a lot more wet fly yeah, and an occasional dry, uh, other than the hex. And, but then they 71 to by the mid seventies, man, dry flies were that was it. Oh, really? You were going, and that's when you started seeing. By the late seventies, you had your full-on dry fly snobs. <laughs> I mean, dry or die bullshit. Where <laughs> I don't give it. They don't do anything. But they still have it. You know, it's like when when you look at nymph fishing coming into this business. There were the shop I talked about, Gates uh, Saba Lodge, which <clears throat> Cal Gates started. That's that was the guy who where uh, I, I'll tell you how huge it was. Mike Lawson told me that he got his start tying flies, he and Cheryl Lee, uh, for Cal Gates in the 70s. And he told me, and I'm quite positive of the number, that he told me they did 5,000 dozen flies for the shop. And this shop is was literally not 20 by 20. Hmm. I bet you there's not five fly shops in the United States that sell 5,000 dozen dry flies a year today and that was five thousand dozen uh no hackles huh. wow. <laughs> i'm like and i that's i just went oh my god i had no idea uh, but you know it's just it was an incredible number he told me because i said i don't think any shop does that today yeah and and that's how big it was you know there of course that's a that's a uh, Northern Michigan is not populated, but when you look in at the, you know, Chicago, Detroit, Cincinnati, Columbus, and all that, and P- all that stuff that would come up there to fish, it's a lot. And that's before internet. So mm-hmm. that's how fast it grew <clears throat> into, and that's when I got started, you know, in 75 and, and right in there. And that's, it, it was kind of just blowing up then. And yeah. so then, you know, there was no, Hell, I mean, the thing I look at was I'm buying flies, you know, for the shop, and I'm looking at 12 pages of uh, terrestrials. I mean, <laughs> they have terrestrials. <laughs> yeah, the worst. You had a Joe's Hopper, you know, and yep. you had, you know, La Torte Ant and or Cricket or whatever, and and it was just they weren't there. Now, I mean, when you look at the dry fly. Uh, just catalog, you know, look at Montana flies or whatever. Yeah. And you'll see there's just this, I mean, oh my God, I don't, I don't know how many thousand patterns there are now for just basic dry fly. Hmm. And so it, it kind of took over, I would say during the eighties. Uh, well, what I was, you know, it just, I would say somewhere in the eighties, it just basically took over. Sorry, I'd let the dog up. Oh yeah squeaky door yeah uh, it pretty much took over to the point where and i was saying about gates when you look at how it's changed now with all the different flies and nymphs the euro nymphs and all that stuff if you go back in time in the 70s mid early 80s they didn't sell nymphs in shops hmm. <laughs> some of them refused to sell yeah. nymphs in shops and so it was that it had gone that far Swinging. You know, I bought yeah. my first flies in Grayling, Michigan, and it was my dad bought me a box of flies, and and the guy tied them right. It was funny back in the day, the pharmacies, barber shops and pharmacies is where you got flies, 
<laughs> wow. <laughs> and I went into this pharmacy, and he had a little fly shop in there, and and we bought. I had three dry flies, and I think nine. And I think they're all Adams, and which again that happened. You know, the Adams is right eight miles from my house, and but that was invented on Mayfield Pond, and for the Boardman River, and I think all the rest were wet flies, hmm. and it, it was still a. We're still, that was in the 70s still. It was still just growing, you know. And so when I came in, it was pretty much all, you know, at that point in the mid-70s, man, everything you read, you know, Carl and Doug had such an influence on that industry. Yep. Uh, everything you read was dry fly, yeah. you know, for the most part. And then, I mean, there was always obviously everything, but, I mean, that was... That was the the selective trout trout strategies was the river runs through it of the oh, right. 90s. <laughs> does that does that change? Was, you know, when you look at it today, uh, you know, when you think about matching the hatch. I mean, you don't necessarily have to always match the hatch, right? Can you talk about you know, uh, like other? What's the alternative to matching the hatch? I mean, is there some more general stuff you can you can use out there? Well, sh- well, sure. You can always just go out and search any you know. Pa- I mean. Believe it or not, we we on this river the probably the best dry fly fishing on the Madison is, and you know hell I'm looking at snow out now right hmm. now I'm looking at the mountains we're at wow. 6200 and we haven't we've had you know we've just came through a whole winter snow thing the best dry fly fishing on this river is in January for midges hmm. and we'll go out and throw chubby Chernobyls behind a midge larva I mean if there's no dries up and they'll you'll get you can get fish to eat a, a chubby in just, you know, February. Hmm. It, it, you know, who knows why, but as far as, I mean, I had sure as hell because there's not a thing on that water that's, you know, bigger than an 18 for the next two, three months. But, you know, you can general search and, and to tell you the truth, that's what happened. And, and if the truth be known, that's how modern streamers really came about too, is that, we would basically just search dry flies at Michigan and we had very poor hatches. You had a spring hatch in the, you know, the Hendrickson's, but then you had this mid all summer where there weren't that many great day hatches, but yet we were so dry fly driven that we would just, we would, we would search, you know, with it, not necessarily the tractor patterns always, you know, you get, you can search with an attractor like a Royal coachman or, whatever, some kind of terrestrial, or you can run whatever fly you think might hatch later and hope for that. But it was kind of boring. Yeah. Because it really wasn't that effective. And now in the as you move into your seasons, you know, hence we can talk about that later if you want. But I mean yeah. that's how your terrestrial bite starts. You know, it's not that there's I hear that all the time. Oh, is it hopper season? Well it's not such thing as hopper season. It's just loss of other insect season and so as you move through your season and you suddenly have no biomass in the mid currents where your bugs are hatching and you have no bugs floating on the surface they have to edge out and become terrestrial based and so they start looking for hoppers and ants and stuff like that but that's more that's more indicative of the fact there's no biomass in the river there's no bugs you know and so we had that all the time back there. We had a lot. We had really good evening fishing, great spinner falls, but our day fishing wasn't that great until we got into the terrestrials time, and then we could ant them up and stuff. But all right. for here, for general fishing, I mean, you can always, you know, and I think that happened universally for almost everyone. In the 70s, we started looking, it's like, okay, well, we can beat our head against this thing and, and try to match a hatch that's not there. Now, and it's completely different when you came out here. You had a lot better. Yep. Uh, the guy I told you in the beginning that was part of the Swisher and Richard group, uh, Dave Ellis, who's the single best angler I've ever met in my life. It's just embarrassing to fish with this guy. He's 82, I think, now, and or three, and I still, <laughs> I don't care if we're in the salt or in dry fly. I don't care. He still likes, it's just like, oh, shit, I'm going to get my ass kicked again. <laughs> and <laughs> he's just that great, but yeah. I, and I asked him once, because he had this thing about the bighorn, and I said, what's your deal with the bighorn? 
oh, what's your thing? This is back before I'd been out here much. And he goes, it's pretty simple. What's supposed to work does hmm. because there was biomass, you know, yeah. so you get out here. But you go to the really techy dry rivers, you go out in the Henry's Fork, and I don't care how good you are. When you say you caught fish, you're somebody. I mean, you get on those tacky rivers where it's pure dry fly, you know, in the, in the ranch style. All right. And, I mean, you can go search. You're going to, until it's terrestrial world, you're going to struggle, you know. And so just generic searching, which is, if it's going to happen anywhere, it's in freestone, like this river right here, the Madison, because they're, they're, it's, they're opportunistic because there's so much broken water. You don't get the long drifts and stuff mm. like that. But it's still not going to, I mean, for every, and I hear it every, all the time in my shop, you know, how'd you do? Oh, I got two. Yeah. And it's like, wow, this is the middle of this, you know, if you were nymphing, you'd have got 30. Yeah. And, but they're dry or die, you know, you still, they're, they're going to go and they're going to fight it. And they're, that's fine. It's what people want to do, you know. Do you see that with, you know, when you compare nip fishing or even streamer fishing to dry fly fishing that on average, you're just going to catch a lot fewer fish on dry flies unless like you're right in the middle of a, a main hatch? Yeah, exactly. I mean, you're just asking the fish to do break its habit and they don't, you know, fish don't like to move. And it, if you got stocker poppers or if you've got, you know, juvenile fish, a lot of juvenile fish around there, you know, you take that 12 inch fish who's kind of like a 13 year old boy, you know, you can run and eat and fall into a rock pile and fall asleep. <laughs> There's different, but, yeah. but they, <clears throat> they're not, that's not what you're there no, for. No. And so, you know, getting a fish to move six to 10 inches vertically is really difficult. Even when there's hatches, they move, they fish start on the bottom. I mean, it's a cycle, but it's a daily cycle. And it's an annual cycle. They, they start on the bottom and they're waiting for nymphs. Right. Mm -hmm. And they're looking for that biomass. Once those bugs start hatching, they move up the water column and they follow that hatch. They don't sit on the bottom and bolt up to the top to eat a size no. 16 or 18 mayfly. They follow that entire biomass. They feed where it is. They drop back down. Mm. And then suddenly you're throwing a fly out there and you're asking it to do something it really doesn't do. <clears throat> yeah. And so and the same thing, like I said, on the terrestrial, it's the same thing. There's no biomass. They move. They start on the bottom. Instead of moving up to the top, they move to the edge where it's shallow or looking for anything that's blown in or just flies in, you know, but there's no, there's no biomass. So gotcha. it's the same thing. You hatch in the daytime or seasonably it starts and moves over. But the, you know, it, it's not that you won't, especially if you've got shallow water, fish will tip their heads up. I mean, there's, but as a, as a numbers game, yep. I mean, no comparison. <laughs> nothing's ever going to outfish a nymph. It's, uh, you know, yep. it's never going to happen. Look at this. Look at the popularity of Euro nymphing oh, yeah. right now, which is just tight line nymphing, yep. which we've done forever. You know, people are just getting used to the fact that they can, don't have to have a bobber. Exactly. And so, you know, look at the numbers you can throw. That's because your fly's where it belongs. Yep. It's just you're not asking your fish. It's not some magic. It's nothing new. No. It's just you put your damn fly where the fish in is the eating, strike. not making yeah. the fish come 10 inches up to it. It bumps them in the nose. I mean, my theory on every fly in the world is if it does not offend the fish, he'll, he'll mouth it. I don't right. care if it's a streamer, a dry fly. I mean, <clears throat> I mean especially uh, nymphs. How would you offend the fish? What what type of fly or yeah? How, how do you offend the fish? Well, it could be just totally you know a, a simple a simple one. It, too much flash on a cloudy day. Oh yeah. Now, nothing reflects light. Nothing reflects light without sunlight. There's no lightning bug underwater when there's clouds. I mean, you want to you want to be the world record whitefish catcher? Come out and throw a bright fly on a cloudy day. And so you dull your fly up when it's dark just a little. Just I mean take some of the crazy flash away and you start catching trout. And yep. so trout, especially underwater trout are, they mouth virtually, they're really a tactile eater. They're not very visual. We, th we, we think they're real visual, but they're much more tactile. Almost all trout become fully nocturnal feeders, you know, once they're about 
18 inches long, somewhere in that zone, 18, 20, 22, something. But they, you know, and they think, well, they can see, they, they feed by vibration. They have the most sensitive lateral line in the world. I mean, a brown trout doesn't. They can detect anything, right? And they don't really need to see it, but when they're visually feeding, you know, when they're in the daytime and you're out there fishing, and here comes this bug, they mouth virtually everything. I, I've got a study a kid, uh, not a young man, gave me from Alaska, and it was 96% of all particulate that went by a fish, a trout, was mouthed. Wow. 96 plus percent. Jeez. And so it didn't keep everything. It, it held, you know, every fish. There was a whole bunch of different styles of fish, but they all had a different retention. But the point of the matter is they touched it, right? They put it in their mouth. And hence tight lining or uronymphing, why you hook so many more fish. They exactly. mouth everything. You feel it suddenly. You're not just watching your bobber. And so if it doesn't offend the fish, in some way where he just says no, he may still go over and whoops, you know, Touch it. but they still put it in their mouth. So if it doesn't offend them, if it looks something like in the old days when we got fish and we always kept fish, you, you, it was like the Jaws movie, man. Everything but a freaking license plate was inside right. of those trout. You know, you always found sticks and stones and leaves and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And, and so they, it just didn't offend them. Yeah, yeah, no, and I was, as you're talking, there, I was thinking about, you know, steelhead is a, a similar thing probably when you're swinging for steelhead mm-hmm. and they're, you're getting these tips and taps that they're touching it, you know, and you're, you're probably not offending them. Uh, sometimes yeah. they grab it and they go, but a lot of times they're just, you know, they're kind of messing with it, checking it out. Yeah, just, it's, you know, they're, they're mouth, they're just, that's what they grew up doing. They mouth things, you know. Yeah, no, I think there's a bunch of ways we can uh, take this, and I wanted to talk about a little bit about the no hackle and the cripples and spinners, but maybe we just start this off. I have a, a short blog post. It's kind of a intro to dry fly fishing, and uh, in it, I kind of talk about like the top ten dry flies, you know, of all time sort of thing. Uh, could you talk about? Could you maybe uh, kick out some of your most popular? You know, maybe I don't know if you could do a top ten, but you know, just common. Like if somebody's going to go grab some dry flies for wherever they're going. Could you pick some of those out? Sure. But I think it's important that we talk about, I hope I don't answer a question you're going to ask me, but on design and layout of a fly, the, the thing that, you know, my, my whole cripples and spinners thing was is silhouette or, or what mm. the fish sees, kind of like what we were talking a minute ago about what doesn't offend them. And I think, you know, for me personally, I think that, the, the silhouette of the, from the bottom of the fly, and, and I guarantee you, I've owned a fly shop for 40 some years. I've seen very few human beings ever pick a fly up and look at its belly. Right. They grab it and they look down the back. Well, unless that thing jumps up in the air and is looking at it coming down, he's never going to see that. No. And so, <clears throat> and that comes a lot from the selective trout thing. And so for me, the first thing I look at is the actual silhouette that the fly, uh, and I'll talk about my favorite dry fly, and, but it's what the fish presents. And again, and I think it's the same thing with dry flies. If it doesn't offend the fish, he'll eat it. He'll yeah. mouth it. He's sitting there. And so top 10 would be flies that present a perfect silhouette. Okay. And you, there is no way you couldn't start. And today, and, re, and remember, parachutes are relatively new. Yeah. In the old days, it would have been an Adams, just a standard Adams. Sure. But a parachute Adams would have to be number one in the world, period, end of discussion. <laughs> because 90% of all the other flies are an adaptation. Because we were talking about this yesterday. I was telling Chris or Jeremy, one of the guys at the shop, doing this this podcast this morning. And... I said, uh, we, we were talking, actually what we were talking about, is we, we were talking about that. We, we got into, I have this fly tying contest, uh, last year we did called kill the coronavirus. It was massive. Hmm. It was unbelievably attended. I don't know how it was a bajillion, you know, views and people. And- well, now this is a, you did it like a, a zoom, uh, like a video presentation. On no, tying? we just did it. We just did a YouTube and a oh, Instagram gotcha. thing. We did it weekly. It was really, I was sitting in bed 
And I, I just had to, I was, I was sad that, I mean, everybody's locked down. I'm sitting there going, Jesus, this country is just shutting itself down and everybody's bumming out. And so we got to do something fun. So we did this stupid little contest, kill the coronavirus. We had a Corona beer, just kidding around, you know, we were just, we, we, were, we were thinking it'd be over in a month, right? So we decided we'd have four categories, <laughs> send in your fly, we'd judge it. And everybody that won got a $250 prize and the grand prize winner, uh, it's morphed into a giant thing now. This year will be huge. And grand play last year was going to be get a contract as a contract tire at MFC. We gave a rod away. We gave a vice oh, cool. away. We gave all this stuff. It was super fun. It was, But it was solely – it was just something to get people's mind off of this crap, right? Yeah. And so, but then Chris and I got talking about these flies and the, 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 you know, looking at them and the uniqueness and what makes a fly. And then we, and somehow what I just said, the atoms, you know, and he goes, well, how do you, how do you account for the purple? Hey, this is an atom with a different colored body. I mean, it's, we start, and that was how we were starting on this with the 110. Everything is basically an offshoot of a parachute atoms. Mm. And you could argue, you know, virtually anything in the top 10 is going to be, it's hard to find a fly that's not a parachute anymore for oh, one really? reason. Well, think about how many, that's how true. many are out there. It's not some sort of belt. And the reason being is you get, you create silhouette. Oh, right. When you look at the belly of a fly, it's a silhouette. So my number one would be, and, and, and they're all, and I'd say my top two for sure, without exception, would be an Adams, which was a, a, a Michigan fly tied right outside of Traverse City. And number two or one, I could, I could mix them anytime I wanted, would be what's called a Robert's Yellow Drake, uh, absolute 1940s fly. That, and from the Asable, uh -huh. <laughs> where that whole Swisher and Richards, which is just a deer body here. But again, total silhouette. Yeah. That's all you're seeing. Because when you look at a mayfly from underwater, you're lucky if you see the wing. And, but you see its belly, you see its tail, you see its legs pushing, you see the, the dent in the meniscus, you know, the, the surface of the water. And so for me, it would have to be mayfly wise, it would be that. And then it'd be, but it'd be an offshoot of that. I mean, something, something like a parachute atoms. But I mean, like I said, if you, if you took in a purple haze would be in there, a, a pair of wolves, you know, things that are attractor ish things, uh -huh. generally attractors, you know, but they're all going to be parachutes. Okay. Then you go into the caddis side and for me, it's the same thing. I never understood what an elk hair caddis represented. Not that people haven't caught millions of fish on them. I don't do well on them. But if I trim their hackle off a good portion of it and I can see their belly down in the water, I do better with them. And so most of, like, my caddis don't – there's not so much hackle in them. Yeah. I mean, hackle, hackle to me was an, is an indication of vibration. When you, look at, when you look at a fly quivering on the water in a still photo – you'll see the shock waves off the edge. They're minuscule, but you see them. And that's the only thing I could ever figure out what that blurred vision of the fly was. And so, hmm. like, um, flies, but, you know, they, they, just, they just show the silhouette of the body and then maybe a little movement to the leg or something like that. But not, not, not so... A ton. Not a ton. Yeah, you know, just not a ton. Yeah, just something that's in there. Same with the midges. Uh, and then you start putting the slight adaptations to them that, uh, like on a midge, when you look at a midge, it's generally, you're going to be, you know, people talk about clusters and that's a mating cluster. And you'll see these giant balls of those things where there's just tons of them. But for the most part, they're going to, they're selective on certain rivers. You'll see them where they, like the bighorn, I've seen them eat on. The, you know, the giant clusters of them. But for the most part, it's a one or two fly thing where the male takes the female as she's coming out of the water and another one will come over and grab and they, it's kind of a rolling thing. And you'll see their wings reflect. Hmm. And it's like, poof, poof. And so I put a little flash in that wing on, on those flies. That, I think that's just a trigger, but that's not the question. Yeah. I, I, I diverted there. But <laughs> so I would have... <laughs> I would have two or three 
parachutes and atoms. I mean, yep. you go anywhere in the world with, with five sizes of atoms, and you're going to fish every mayfly find. Okay. And 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 for the most part, don't really care about the colors much. Yeah. Uh, and then you go into the Comparadun style flies. Right. Would be my second choice. Uh, I love the Compara spinners where they use. I do a put a second wing on it, uh, but a Comparadun style fly. Yep. Um, that would be in there. Uh, the, my favorite flies was just one of mine, which obviously I'm gonna like one of my own. But um, it's called a Found Link. Oh yeah. And that's right. The Found Link is a Compara done with a spinner wing, with the body of the. It's it's combo world. Yeah. It is the body and tail of the Robert's Yellow Drake. It's the Compara spinner and a Compara Dunn. So it's huh. got the same body as the old school 1940 fly. It's got a little Z line wing, and then it's got a little hair wing, Comparadun style, and the elk hair cat is head really tight. All right. So it's buoyant. It's one color. It's the only dry fly I've fished in for around here for probably six years now. It doesn't, it, it sits with its belly in. It's kind of got. A lot of, but it's nothing really specific. Yeah. And I've fished it everywhere I've ever fished. And last in the top 10, and that'd be my style, uh, last would be an ant of any sort at okay. any time of the year. I mean, an ant's not like the, you know, when I moved out west, I couldn't believe, people didn't know what ants were. They they were I, I they would always say Amy's ant like right. says, no that's a chubby Chernobyl man <laughs> the hell has that got to do with an ant I never I've asked Jack that a hundred times the hell was it an ant why do you call it an ant you know it's a freaking stonefly yeah <laughs> but you take I mean Mike Lawson knew you know Mike's he 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 was one of the first I mean Mike is a dry fly and that guy's he's oh, machine cool. and the dry fly he's so good and but he has his honey ant. Renee Harrop has one, his, you know, they've all got their, their flight ants. I would say the ant is the first bug to come and the last one to go. And it's probably the least fished. It should yep. be people's number. It's one of your go-to bugs. Hmm. Don't care where, don't care. There's no place on the planet that doesn't have ants. Yep. And it's really an underfished fly. And so, and, and I always have, when I, just like with the nymph, so it doesn't offend the fish, I always have a little flash in my ant wings, mm. if it's a flight ant, mm -hmm. because they don't really, they're, they're, they're kind of not supposed to be on the water. And so sometimes when you see them, they're rolling and they reflect because they have bigger wings when they turn to flight, you know, not your, your females, when they flight, when they recolonize, they hit the water and they're, they're just they're toast, right? And they roll around. And they got these big wings that reflect light. But I always have ones without, also. And so, and and back to that old days of dry flies when we always had a match. When you had a dry Adams and mm -hmm. a wet Adams, a, a dry K Hill and a light, you know, a light K Hill wet, light K Hill dry. Same thing with your ants. Always have a sunk ant. They're okay. They're just old school. But so somewhere in there it would be a parachute Adams and a parachute. Uh, Robert Yellow Drake. It would be a cat, two different styles of caddis. And I'll tell you one of it's, it's, and it's, I don't even, I should know this and I don't remember who did it. It's called a corn fed caddis. Uh -huh. And it's just a buzz of stuff, right? <laughs> Doesn't look like anything to me, cats. Man, they eat the hell out of that. Yep. It's just generic. It's just totally rough. And in the old days, they, I remember somebody did an article about they'd take a mayfly and they would, take a bore cleaning tool and rough it all up so it looked like it had been fished the hell out of it, right? Just been fished to death. I'm thinking, you could tie that that way before instead of tying it and, and making it look awful later. <laughs> but that same thing, a little bit generic. If, if you want to read a great read about dry flies, yeah. read Gary LaFontaine's book, uh, his dry fly book, and about... Um, uh, the the dry fly. I think okay. it's the, I can't remember. The, I think it's called the dry fly oh, okay. or dry fly. I think, I think it's the dry fly. I can't yeah. remember. But he talks about when he's filming, and you know, it was he's underwater and he's watching these flies, 
And he keeps talking about how the flies that were rough get way more inspection. Now, not necessarily, I think on, on most of his dives, because they're underwater. And his theory was that the ones that were super tight had more, it was easier to see they weren't right because there's something wrong. But All if they right. were fuzzy, they went up and like, well, I don't know what the hell that is. And they did it. And that goes back to the thing of it didn't offend them. Yep. Right. And so <laughs> I don't know. It's I, I have I probably fish 10 dry flies, uh, it, you know, and most of them are some sort of compare done or a parachute. Yeah, exactly. Well, pretty much it. No, I'll, I'll put together. I think if I can find some time, I might put together that list if I can go back through it and uh, and send it back over to you and maybe put together a little uh, a quick little PDF, sure. PDF download that people can you know, go to the show notes and grab, but um, I'm, I'm just, sure, inter- sure. I'm interested, you know, and obviously it's top 10 or whatever is not a really a big thing. It's, you know, it's more your, your river. I mean, if you think about, let's, let's just take to the Madison real quick. Can you do us a quick little rundown throughout the Madison and maybe that'll give us an example of the different hatches or, you know, just kind of generally as you go through the, the year, is that pretty simple or is that really detailed when you talk about the different bugs? Just this river you mean? Yeah. If you talk about just, yeah, just the Madison. Yeah, it would be. It's. I mean, it's. It's kind of simple. It's kind of complex in respect that it starts. And in, in, you know, I think a lot of the. A lot of the. Sorry, I had to go get some coffee. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think a lot of the. This, like all the rivers in the West, I think is why they're so fertile is that they have midges, hmm. and so your number one bug on this river is a midge just like our number one nymph is a midge pattern because they're 365. They never leave. They never stop having the opportunity to feed on those things. So as you go into the spring, you know, your midge all winter, if you want to start in January, yep. your midge, 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 you got three months or so, and then you run into your spring betas, which is going to be, again, you know, a size 18, 20, blueing olive of some, you know, parachute yep. atoms. There, I can tell you that when I moved here, uh, I would say 90% of the guides I spoke to fish and, and fish them year round, uh, mind you, mm-hmm. a parachute at them. There you go. And so it's, that's what you fished. And if you put it over the fish properly, they were going to eat it. What about versus the, um, the parachute just versus the basic, the regular atoms? I mean, what, what's the, I, mean, I guess you're talking the, the silhouette, but is that, is there a huge difference there? Well, I think if you were to trim it out, and lay it flat spinner style on, you know, with that hackle. Uh, yeah, I think it does. They sit differently. They don't, their silhouettes, not as good yeah. from underneath, you know, they don't ride as well. If somebody's listening and they're thinking, you know, they want to grab some dry flies, does it make any sense to grab any of those atoms, just the regular style or, or should they just grab parachutes? There's certain times when for me, and I don't know when to de- how to describe it because I really, they're just snooty fish and every once in a while, I'll put on an old school Adams with a hen wing Adams, you know, the original style. I tend to put a little V in the bottom of them so they don't sit quite so straight up and down. It's kind of Catskill style. You know, Catskill style flies are taller, longer tails, taller, taller hackle and wing. And, And that's another one that I'll fish, especially when I have crane flies, small crane flies around. A fish a traditional red quill, uh, I don't, they just eat it because it's mm. bouncy, I think. I think it's just that it's sitting up there and rolling. But uh, the Adams regular, we don't even sell them anymore. Oh, really? They've become so non-existent. There you go. Yeah. It's just, uh, it, you just almost nothing. I, I can't think. There's not very many traditional tide flies. And, and actually, when we had them, people would ask what they were. <laughs> It's just, it's a new generation of angler, yeah. you know, and, and that, that happened a long time ago. Yeah. But so anyway, you go into the midges, your betas, and then you're going to run off and out here. And the thing that happens on this river and it happens on a lot of them is you'll get 95% of your hatch. You'll have, you know, a dozen bugs going from the 25th of June until the 25th of July. Oh, right. And then the, you get bomb, but you know, you'll have everything. You'll still have, you'll have betas. You'll have E. Puris, you know, mayfly wise, you'll have E. Puris, betas. Uh, oh my 
God, I'll forget something here. Yeah. Um, PMDs, you'll have yellow sallies, golden stones, salmon flies, <laughs> uh, shit, what else? and three different caddis, <laughs> right. all going at once. It, they can overlap themselves at some day, right? And yep. so that's what makes that why the Western rivers, if you, you know, you go down to the Henry's fork or you have Calabatus, you know, and you'll have, you get down on some of these rivers and it always happens the same way. You just get the, the plethora of all these bugs. There's just, you know, a yep. dozen of them. And usually there's three, you know, like you'll have Rikes and you'll have PMDs and Sally's and then you'll have, you know, then you'll, one will fade out, and then you'll have some epures and some goldens, and or I mean some salmon flies, and mm-hmm. and they kind of, you know, they're blending over top of them. And some of them last for multiple broods, and they'll be here for all. Like some of your caddis are here most of the year, most of summer, and the epures can be six, eight weeks long. You know, the calabatus coming off the lake, you don't see them down here as much, but up between the lakes, and so you get a blend. And so it's, and it, it, the difficult part of that is that this is a Caddis River. This is, this <laughs> river is Caddisville. You go down yeah. to the Henry's Fork, they got Caddis too, but it's Mayfly World <laughs> because you got your burrowing Mayflies down there, your big drakes. And so, you know, every river has a little nuance, but this is a Caddis River. You can fish a Caddis year round, nymph wise. I don't care. There's always a, you know, lots of larva down there. And, and the midges are much the same, you know, it's all larva and so worm-like. And so it's this river for the most, and then it goes right back. You'll kind of tail out and it goes right back to how it starts. Hmm. It goes midges and betas and then midges. Really? And, and so you'll have fall betas, which has been great. I mean, it's still fishing. They're still fishing like a champ right now. You got midges hatching and betas hatching. The betas will essentially just stop and it'll be pure midge and 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 i'm talking dry flies i'm not just yeah, in, yeah, just nymphing, but yeah but yeah then the midge fishing will start it's well it's been going on for almost a month and that will never end hmm. and you know every year in january february we post up the, the midge pods out back of the shop or down you know wherever any soft water and people for a long time just thought it was like still photography or oh, not, right. what do they call it slow slow tv it's a european uh, <laughs> slow tv they, they had a thing in europe where they we wondered if it was when we still had the fish when i still had fly fish tv gene herring the producer yep. was telling me about this thing called slow tv where i think he was making comment to how fast i was catching fish but it slow tv would be like a picture of it's it's motion picture but it's a picture of a gate and you're waiting for somebody to open it and it never really opens <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I think it was some reference to how fast I was catching fish, but <laughs> Hey, this is like watching European slow TV, but, <laughs> but a lot of people would see that and you'll see in the winter and you'll see 50 heads up at once. Oh, and it's just like the fish move into these pod zones and Damn. it's just stupid how they get to eat. But huh. so as far as, uh, you know, and, and that's what makes us a little difference. We blend our caddis are almost always in the peak of that. So we have caddis hatching with mayflies and salmon flies or goldens or yeah, sallies or whoever. Yeah. You know, so it's kind of a, it's a caddis river where you run, drop just some of the rivers are almost specifically mayfly. Gotcha. So on the caddis, so again, if you did have an elk hair cast in your box, you're saying you could you could trim up you would trim up that hackle a little bit and just that might make it a better. I did, yeah, yeah. I did. I mean, caddis. There's a there's a book by Leonard Wright Jr. called "Fishing the Caddis as a Living Insect," which everybody on Earth should read hmm. because he was he was in the '60s talking about moving caddis and moving, and if you transfer that. Not in mayfly world so much, but your terrestrial and your caddis. And, you know, a lot of my flies, my butch caddis in particular is a, is a skater, my double wing. They're made to twitch, hmm. right? Because a lot of your caddis don't ride the water long. They, no. They used to call them popcorn. You know, they yep. pop out and popcorn Fly-ratic, exploders and, and, you know, just poof, they're out. And, and on this river, most of them are divers. They come back, they hit the water and dive to the bottom and lay their eggs. Huh. 
and then they fly and uh, crawl back out. I mean, and and a lot of those are multi brooders. They can go for three, four weeks, and they have and multiple brood. They don't just die in the water. Everybody thinks they just die. They don't. They don't all do that. They don't all lay their eggs on the surface. But when you see them, they don't always make it through the surface. And when they come back, if they're obviously if they're dropping eggs, they dip and they move and they pump and boom, boom, boom. They're all over the place, right? Yeah. And if they're going to dive, they come down, they hit the water, and there's commotion. And so a lot of those flies, if you twitch them, and like if you take an Alcare caddis, and if you twitch it, it becomes a pretty damn good fly. <laughs> hmm. You know, but as a dead drift fly, I don't like it. And then I, and so if I'm dead drifting a, ma- a caddis, excuse me, I'm going to, like a lot of times in the evening, and they're just coming back to lay that first, especially in the beginning of it. Uh, they're, they're movie, but then after they've been on these things, they'll eat a dead drift pretty well. That's when I make my bodies less fuzzy and, you know, but if it's a hatch and it's, or, you know, it's a little bit more commotion. Right. And so that's when the elk here, I think does its thing better, but it's all you got to do is trim. I mean, it's so simple to trim Mm -hmm. the back two thirds of the flies hackle off and set his at and, and and the body and trim it flat and, then, and so you can see it. It's, it when you look at a, a caddis underwater and you look at it from the bottom or just sit it, it, just sit in your truck your car or whatever and there's caddis on the windshield and look what the fly shows you mm-hmm. it's a tube they have tiny little legs they don't have giant yeah. it's a tube and there's a if you're lucky there's a little v for the wing depends on how it's laying its wings but it'll just be a tube and these tiny little legs if they're all private personal, they're a damn stick. Hmm. There's just nothing to it. There's no wing silhouette because it's folded against its body, just That's like right. a salmon fly or you know, a stone fly. And so it's if the the elk hair, if I'm moving it, that's different. But yeah. if I and, and I and I tend to move my caddis quite a bit. How do you twitch them? Well, we'll talk about like what, what is that? Rod look tip. Like? Just rod tip. Just, it's a very small rod tip. And and by the way, there's a thing called the South Fork Twitch which uh, Jason Pruitt and Larry Larson introduced me oh, yeah. to about 20 years ago, two super stick guys. But uh, they, you, you should watch these guys on the South Fork of the Snake. They, 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 they're active fish virtually all of their terrestrial. I don't care what it mm. is. And it's a downstream mend, and you just twitch it. You just get the line tight on the fly. <clears throat> you don't try to pick it up and dab-style fish no. it where you pop it off the surface, but you... You twitch it with a, just a small wrist twitch. And just hit your rod. You get, your line's got to be a little bit tight, and you twitch it, and you twitch yeah. it, and twitch it, and you just kind of t t t You're not looking for an eternal drift. You're looking for the fly. You know, you're looking, you know, if we're fishing cats, obviously we're fishing the heads. And so it's twitch, two kind of quick twitches. Just the fish is used to seeing those flies eat, you know, move. And so twitch, twitch. It's not like you're doing it 25 times. You're... You're yeah. going over a fish's head, maybe twitch it two or three times at most, gotcha. and then and then let it pause. And so it's, but you you watch these guys fish their hoppers, you'd think they're fishing a streamer. They fish those things, and and I've been with Jason when he, I, I think he was getting reactionary bites equal to what I would have got with a streamer. Oh wow! I mean, he's he's drawing fish because he's running his. And we were in a boat, so we could run him longer. Uh huh. He's running that fly so active that I think he triggered a, a, a just a reactionary streamer bite. Wow. I mean, these things, they weren't coming up and eating it. These things were turning downstream and attacking the huh. damn thing. <laughs> it was just like, and so he's wow. doing more than just the little twitch you're talking about. He's doing a— Oh, yeah, yeah. No, yeah. he's he's running them. But we were in a boat. That was That's different. We weren't, we weren't fishing heads. We were in a boat just— Floating. And by fishing heads, and, what, what do you mean by fishing heads? Actively feeding on the surface. Oh, right, right. Act, you know, I, we can see fish up and, you know, like at night when I'm fishing caddis here, because uh, that's, you know, or, or for that matter, if it's daytime. The thing about the daytime feeding is the bugs can be, they're, it's the same as a spinnerfall. It, you know, they can be anywhere in the water because they're, they're, they're at the mercy of a current, right? So... That's the difference. That was the premise of my whole Cripples and Spinners book was that spinners come back to a specific style of water, as do the caddis. 
to lay their eggs. But when they're hatching, especially on this river, hell, it's in this, the 50 mile riffle. Hmm. You start hatching here, it might take you 100 yards to get up because the water's hauling ass. Oh, wow. You know, so he takes off, and here's a current. Maybe he starts over on one side of the river and he gets caught in a current. He might be in the middle of the, the river in 50 feet trying to emerge, right? Yeah. And so they're all over the place. And so then it's not as easy, but in the evening, when I'm watching the boat, you know, I go out and I look for heads. I just look for fish feeding. And, you know, a lot yeah. of times I'll fit, that's when I'll be dead drifting because they're not as long a drift. And, but occasionally, if I'm, like I said, if I'm twitching it, it's got to be <clears throat> just, that's when, that's when it can be bulkier. That's when that corn fed caddis, I told yeah. you, that thing is unreal. Yep. And it's just, it's mayhem. There's huh. stuff everywhere. So that's, that's, <laughs> and it's, but yeah. it's still got the body silhouette still right there tight underneath. Yeah. No, that's a good, I think that's a good tip to have a few different, uh, you know, variations depending, right? Sure. Have a thicker one and have a thinner one. And carry, you... and carry a piece, uh, carry some scissors. Just yeah, exactly. Try trim it. And the same thing with your mayflies, any of them. I mean, we don't, or if you're fishing traditional, you know, the hackle. Uh, which still fish right, you know, give them a pull so you, the, the, the body, so, you know, just make a V, just separate the hack a little bit under the bottom and get it a little bit lower and yeah. boom, boom, you know, it's just that easy. That's cool. Um, I wanted to get into a little bit on just uh, some more of the background on dries. This is some general stuff, but, you know, if you think, if you break out, if somebody's kind of maybe new, maybe they've been fishing a lot of nips and they want to get into dry fly fishing, and I think of, you know, like the gear you need, um, you know, the casting, talking about the take, matching the hatch. We've talked about some of this stuff, but what are the, what is the stuff people really need to know if they're, if they're kind of going out there for the first time? As far as maybe just start with the gear, is there anything special? I mean, dry fly seems like you just grab a whatever rod and go for it. And does that really matter that much? Well, you know, accuracy becomes, and you know, I've said this on every podcast with you, know, you and I or anybody else have done, stock more, cast less. Yeah. Good dry fly angler stock. You know, you know, there's just the most important thing you're going to do is get the, I don't care if you can throw 30, 50 feet. I don't care. And I'll get shit about that from somebody yep. though, you know, blah, blah, blah. You, you, your fly has to do, it has to ride properly. Even if you're twitching there, twitching doesn't mean out of control. Hmm. Twitching means you, that's the ultimate in control. When you can twitch a dry fly and have it pause and not drag, yeah, then you're somebody. Hmm. Just because you can throw the damn thing 50 feet doesn't mean you got convergent seams, you got water tightening up your leader, and you know, and a rare case, and it's like, it's all I ever hear about, oh, it was 50 foot pass, my, my ass, you couldn't tell which way the fish was feeding 50 feet away. <laughs> That's a long way. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> so uh, I, I'm stock more, cast less, get a good drift, controlled drift, know which way the fish is feeding, left or right, right or left. Make sure you know where the side of your leader is. Can you control your leader? People don't even know what controlling their leader means anymore. Yeah. I mean, the, uh, controlling your leader means you have control of the end of the leader, not the middle of the damn thing. Yeah. It means that you've got, you have the ability to let that fly drift properly. And so, uh, you know, Gary LaFontaine was, I remember in that same book, Dry Fly, he was all pissed off at the new rods. This is back as graphite's just coming out, right? And he was saying how it made everybody uh, straight line casters and they couldn't control their leaders. And they, and if you think back then, those rods were soft as can be. Think about now. Poof, oh, yeah. thing stams it. You know, they jack that thing, goes, pow, straight out in a straight line. Well, hell, the thing's going to drag instantly. Yeah. But for me, Equipment wise, I mean, I still think an eight and a half, five weight for dry flies is the best rod. It's most accurate. Yep. I'm not going to cast more than 25 feet yep. ever if I can help it. If I can do it, I prefer to be 15 feet. Yeah. I mean, if I, I get control, I mean, it's just so many things that affect that leader. And so, you know, and then tippet wise, I think that's a touch overrated certain rivers i mean you wouldn't want to say that on the you know henry's fork sure. place where it's just super tech world mm -hmm. uh, but the same thing and I've, I've watched a lot of the great anglers down there and you don't see these mega casts you watch these guys stock and stock and stock <laughs> and you decide i mean a lot of times fish will feed one direction how do you determine which which way they're feeding left or right or where, how, you're how, looking you can just you're see watching them, them. you're looking 
you're close enough to see his head turning to the right every time. Yeah. Or, you know, or, you know, if he's going both ways and, and he's left, right, left, right, you sure as hell better be timing that. If you're just casting from 40 feet away, you can't see which way his head, you just see the rise for yeah. him. You know, you get on top of him and then you can see, you know, as close as you can. I mean, think about this. We've got this trend of Euro nymphing, which is just tight line nymphing. We've been yep. doing it since the 70s. But now it's the thing, right? Oh, yeah. Think how far you're casting a Euro nymph. Yeah. One rod length. Yeah, not very far. <laughs> you can't tight line 30 feet from yourself. I mean, unless you're seven feet tall and you got a 20 foot <laughs> rod, I suppose you could. But think of it. We're, I mean, you've got all these people catching, they're doubling their fish counts. And they're fi- literally fishing a rod length away from them. Yeah. Whereas before Euro, before tight, people started figuring out tight lining. Before that, they would cast an indicator yep. to the middle of the dam exactly. river. Exactly. And they couldn't control it, and they'd start this mend, mend. Yep. Oh, that shit drives me crazy. Mend. <laughs> so every time they'd mend, it's right where the dam fish is, and they'd mend it, and their flies would go flapping up in the air. It was the same thing with your dry fly. Yeah. You can cast to the fish, but can you control the fly for two feet? Can you get a two-foot drift? No. Yeah. You know, it's like you hope, <clears throat> and then you see the big men thing. Oh, my God. I mean, unless you're grease line in a dry fly for steelhead where you can control it. I mean, even then, think about if you're a really good dry fly steelhead angler, you can control your V. And if you can't control your V, the guy next to you will catch every fish on it from right behind you. If you're just waking the damn thing with a 12 foot long V, like it's water skiing, yeah. you don't get eats. But when you can control that <clears throat> and give it a six, eight, 10, 18 inch V and you can pause it and start it and you, you, you draw fish. It's no different than trout. Yeah. You got to have control. So I like, you know, personally, I like the softer, uh, shorter rods. For me personally, I run nine footers too, but yeah. mostly it's a five weight, eight and a half, five. Yep. Yep. And, uh, you know, generally in tippet wise, you're between five and, and, and super techie water, you might be going lighter than that. Mm-hmm. But that's again indicative of the, of the size of the fly. You got your fly's got to be based on your leader too, because if you got a size 12 fly and put it on 5X, it's going to spin the hell out of your leader. Yep. So, I mean, some of those things are just learning. Yeah. You, know, you got to figure out which, and I always err on heavier for my leaders. If, you know, if I, if everybody tells me they're fishing six etch, I go to at least to four first and then five. And, hmm. if, if, and then I make it, make me go down. I hate six X. It's just, especially if you got weeds, <laughs> It's like, okay, that was a nice hook set, but I'm never going to land that fish. But, you know, that's, yeah. but that's just, that's just how you play your own game. I mean, I got plenty of buddies that fish 6X, six, six, and that's part of their fun. You know, it's whatever. Yeah. Oh, yeah, trying to not, trying to not lose it. It's funny, you're talking about the men, men, men. Uh, Hank Patterson, who, who I had on a while back, has a funny skit on that. Um, exactly what you're talking about, the whole nipping and mending. And mm-hmm. So I'll put that in the show notes, that, that video. It's, it's, it's pretty freaking hilarious uh, if I could find it. Yeah. So, okay. So, so basically, yeah, the gear is pretty straightforward. I mean, so on the cast, and you've talked a little bit about this as far as the presentation is obviously important. Are there any specific casts that somebody should need to know um, trying to present that fly? For sure, you need to know how to do a reach cast. I yeah. mean, uh, a lot of, uh, you know, traditional dry fly, I mean, go to the European style, go to certain rivers, you can't fish anything but straight upstream to a rising fish. I mean, hmm. they have rules, right? Yeah. Huh. <laughs> you go on certain beats over there, and the ghillie will tell you when you get to cast to it, when he thinks it's right. Wow. So there's, that's tradition. So you got upstream dry fly is traditional. I prefer to fish downstream to my fish as often as possible. Hmm. I like to... And I like to a reach cast on upstream or cross stream is absolutely correct. Cause it just gets your line above your fly. And so you get a little bit longer drift yep. and, but there's a pile cast or a, it's kind of a tuck cast in a sense um, when you're fishing downstream. So you just, you know, you, you stop it and let it bounce back mm-hmm. a little bit. So then the fly, the leader, it, it gets, 
coils in yeah. it, kind of, you know, serpentine, and it allows you to feed the fish straight down. And a lot of techie water, I, I like to fish down at my fish. And But if I had my absolute preference, it would be up, stream slightly off to one side down to the fish and then i'd do a reach cast and maybe a pile with it where i'd stop it and let it get that soft slack to the leader but for the most part if you know if you can stop your rod give it you know a little bit of shock wave to your leader or a reach cast you'd be that's all you'd really need yeah that's it okay i and, mean it yeah. and then stalk more i was gonna say get the stalking on. is interesting because you know, like you're saying, you get you like to get within 15, 20 feet or so. And some people probably are thinking like, wow, how, how do you avoid those fish seeing you? You know, which is a lot of people probably worry. Like, how, how do you? They know you're there. Yeah. <laughs> Roy, so you, that's not a big concern. <laughs> yeah, you, you aren't, you, you know, if you're, it's a, I guess it's a dilemma. It, it's, it's a catch 22. Yeah. You make a shit cast because you're 40 feet away. Your line tightens up. Your lead, your fly drags over that fish once. If he's if he's any sort of sophisticated fish, you put him down and you're done, right? Yeah. I mean, so you make you you think you're going to do the cast and you sit there, or you stock up close and you make the, you know, I prefer to make one really clean cast as opposed to twenty shit ones that yeah. the fish never, you know, and occasionally get lucky and he eats it, but. You know, I just, for me, the dry fly game's always been, growing up in Michigan, you know, we don't have these giant rivers, right? Well, yeah, there's a few, but for the most part, you could see your fish, you were, they, they know you're there, hmm. and I don't care, I, I watched, I watched Renee Harrop one day fishing, I, I've never fished the Henry Swerk with Renee, but I sit and I poached him one day, <laughs> and I watched that guy stalk this fish, and he's on the other side of the river, and I and I know that, and, and I don't, I've, I've not fished with Renee, so I don't know him well like that, you know, just casually. But I fish with Mike a lot, and he mm-hmm. he's the same thing, right on top of him. Hmm. But I watched Renee stalk that fish for 20 minutes, and I know I could, he could see it he, at any time he could have cast, and I never once acknowledged I was on the other side, I never said a thing, and it was just like, wow, that was really cool. He just kept sliding a little bit. He sit there, no kidding. and he made one short cast and hooks the fish. I'm pretty certain first cast might have been second, and I went, "Wow, wow, that's like that was one of the coolest things I've ever watched in my life." And you know, he wasn't bent over and crawling on his belly in the weed. He just yeah. <laughs> very casually yeah. and very stealthily moved up into a really good position. And he was offshore, you know, he was down, he was below the fish, but off to the side. And it was just one of the more, it's like watching somebody stalk an animal, uh, you know, that is really good. And they're, they're not necessarily hunched over. You don't think that animal knows that there's a hunch crawling at it as much as he sees. Right. It knows you're there. Yeah. And you're just relaxing. We yeah. have a, I have a guy named Bill Homan who's legally deaf and blind who stays here he's the he he was actually a graphic designer designed my logos and essentially he's completely blind and fishes this river by himself whenever you're whining about something doesn't feel good think about this guy Hmm. falls down a lot you know get into the river he walks a mile down a path that isn't a path but he used to fish out back in my lodge in the side channel when it was it's not as good as it used to be but And he would catch more big fish there. And our our theory was he was like a heron. He would take him forever to get into position, right? And he can see through like a dime spot, dime hole spot. And he could see if he, if he studied long enough, he'd see a fish feeding, but he could, he had to move so slowly and he hooked virtually every fish you ever cast to because he was a heron. Yeah. He just, you know, the, oh, yeah. he just stood there He and he made one cast and then he might have to reconfigure. <clears throat> it might take him three minutes, but he caught, but he was very stealthy. And so, and it's a dry fly game. This isn't a, you know, a dry flies for overall, it's kind of a, it's more of a quality versus quantity, you know, regardless if it's a hatch, it's a, that's going to be one thing. But, but I mean, if you're just, you know, if you're, you're selectively looking for, a fish 
Yep. It's, it, you know, it's about the stock. I mean, you're, you're doing something on purpose. You're making it more difficult on purpose. And so enjoy the stock. Yeah. And then, you that know, cool. it's the same thing. If you're a hunter, yep. you know, there's always this thing. I know a lot of guys that are ranged in at 750, 800 yards. Jeez. Well, there's no stock. No. I'm much more impressed watching Fred Bear with his recurve stalk a white tail, you know, without camo. <laughs> and, it, you know, it's a craft. It's so. Yeah, I hear you. I don't know. I don't, I don't like to make it too artsy. It's still fishing, but it's. Yeah. But I mean, it's, it's what you're doing. You're out there on purpose to make, you know, the whole things. That, and you don't get the thing about a hatch doesn't last forever. No. And so, or an emergence or, you know, caddish or whatever it is, you're lucky if you get two hours of something of this. Mm-hmm. And so you, you really cap, you know, you hone your skill to, and, and you're selecting a fish, you know, you're looking for a big head hmm. and, you know, one that you know is a big fish and it's like, okay, I'll, I'll catch that one. Yeah. That's, I love that perspective. That definitely, yeah, it brings it back home because I, especially with the bow hunting, I see, you know, I've been doing some rifle hunting and had some good success in recent years, but the more I get into it, the more I think like, wow, yeah, the bow hunting would be kind of fun to, to take it to that next level, to get right in, you know, right in with it. Yeah. And, yeah. It's, it's, uh, they're all, it's just different ways to skin the same cat, you know? Yeah. And, and for every, every, you know, rule, there's a rule that breaks it, but overall i mean you asked me about basic dry fly and yeah i would just i would just really same same is stock more cast less and 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 there's more to it than that there's more to it, it's learning what you're doing you know anybody can cast mm-hmm. i mean anybody can go cast out there and throw it out there maybe get it maybe not put the band-aid on your ego oh he quit feeding my ass you put him down yeah Yep. Stock the damn, but learn as you go, you know, you're out there for more than simply catching it. You're trying to figure out, well, what bug are they on? What is the bug doing? Did they, are they, you know, they see, you see all these bugs Yeah. and, and they're buzzing around. Are they buzzing? Are they touching? Are they dipping? Are they dry? Are they, are they coming off the water? Are they staying on the water? You know, my book cripples and spinners is talking about, how the spinner falls come down in specific zone and how they get so specific to certain styles of bugs, right? Mm -hmm. The premise of that book is the fact that they at least half and frequently more than half lay down with their wings on one side. Mm. And so, and they've got to almost always have a curvature to their body and every hook we have is straight. And the whole premise to that book was observe more. At which, and I don't know if you were going to ask me about that or not. I was, I was. I was going to ask you the spinners, you know, spinners make sense. And and why, why add the cripple? Why cripples and spinners? Why not just spinners? Cripples are, have an inability to flight. They have no way to get off the water. Mm. So maybe they're, their wings. And generally speaking, a cripple is the same as a spinner in the respect that one wing didn't come out. Oh, gotcha. Or it got knocked over before it could, you know, wind caught it. Yeah. Uh, and knocked it over, and it's kind of trapped in the in the film, right? So right? it's kind of irregular. It's a little irregular, but actually, maybe it's yeah, not. Maybe it's, it's pretty common to be that irregular. It, especially in wind zones. So you know, the whole west, it's windy, and it knocks them over, and and usually they get up. But and 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 to tell you how that started, and and to see the the importance of it, and back to and it's right back to where we started with the the simplicity of the fly, if it doesn't offend them. Mm-hmm. But I was, there was a guy, Dave Ellis, I told you, but I was watching yep. him one night on a PMD hatch or a spinner fall, excuse me. And he didn't know I was watching him. I saw him, he's got his head underwater. <laughs> he's 70 some years old and he's got his head underwater and he's looking and he comes up and he just strokes his hair back off his head. And, and I just watched him catch two or three fish and and then he, I walk a little bit <clears throat> and he sees me and he goes, Hey, how you doing? And I, you know, we're together. And I said, uh, and I hadn't caught shit. And because the first, when those bugs first hit the water, uh, they, they sit with their wings off the water. They don't land flat and they just sit there like at a 40 degree. And he says to me, cause he realizes I was watching with his head underwater. He goes, man, that never ceases to amaze me. 
I go, what's that? Oh, you know how they, you know, when they first hit the water. Of course, I want to be smart, and, I, and I'm not. And I'm like trying to play dumb. I said, what the hell are you doing? I was like, what is he talking about? He goes, you know how when they hit the water in that first 20 minutes of the spinners? <clears throat> Excuse me. Yeah. And their wings sit at that 40-degree cant and don't lay down. I said, oh, that. Yeah, sure. I'm thinking, what the hell is this guy talking about, <laughs> right? Opens his box. He has an entire box of spinners whose wings are at a 40 degree key. oh wow i've never caught a fish in that first 20 minutes of that damn thing in my life and i just watched him catch three and they stick his head into the water and i was and he's still looking he's still observing yeah right and he's the best i've ever known and so fast forward i go into this i'm on a spinner fall one evening on the boardman river and i catch multiple fish in a row and I mean, I'm like John Wayne, right? Huh. I, I'm just so, I'm the best in the world. Mm-hmm. Oh my God. But I started realizing every fish ate my fly harder. It's like, whoosh, huh. and he'd eat it. And I was like, in the beginning, I thought, that's because I'm just so great, right? Huh. They just, they like my fly better than the real fly. And then your ego subsides slightly and you go, well, When's the last time you were eating dinner and all of a sudden you just grabbed the damn thing and jammed it in your face? You don't do that. Yeah. And neither do fish. No. They don't break cadence. They don't suddenly run over and eat yours harder than the other one. Hmm. And then I realized that I was flat ass getting lucky and I sucked. And they were just turning away. Just they they'd taken it, but they just couldn't refuse it quite quick enough. And I'm like, oh my God, I'm getting lucky on these things. And so I crawled out in the water, completely buck naked, by the way, took my waders off, went out and (laughs) sat in the water. It was, I just couldn't lean over without filling my waders where the fish were. So I just got bucky and went out in the water. (laughs) It's a summer, it's a summertime, I imagine. Yeah, no, it's (laughs) it's, uh, late July. (laughs) And so the water's, you know, still not, there's still plenty of shrinkage. It's cool. (laughs) But the, 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 you get out there and it's like, oh, you know, but I'm watching, I'm watching, and I don't really figure it out. I'm looking like Dave did. I'm looking under, try to see something. All I see are spinners. They're just floating by me, floating by me. And so I came back the next night and I seined up about 150. And I just, I didn't do fish at all. I just came down and I seined up bugs, took them home, and I looked at them in, in this big chafing dish. And I was I was looking at him and looking at him and I took a fly and threw it in the water and I asked my I think she was about five years old then uh, daughter I says does that look like those and she goes not even a little bit walked away <laughs> totally dissed me <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and so I broke those flies into little trays and I started looking at them trying to figure and the first thing I realized it took me a minute was that almost all of them had one wing showing only. And all my flies were spinners, just traditional spinners, right? Two wings flat. The next thing I realized is that they almost all had a curve to their body. And I was like, hmm. oh, my God. You know, it's like light turns on. And so I started doing more saning like that and more saning. And what I realized is about half, if not 70% of the time, there's a curvature to the fish's, the, the, the bug's body. Regardless of it's a dun, if you've got any air, any movement, the bug has the ability to move its abdomen, and it does. And so it's curved. Hmm. And so essentially I was looking at that. That was the nuance to the spinner, right? It was like, yep. oh, my God, you put a little bit of curve to this body, and you're in. How do you put curve to it? You flat bend it. There you go. And so, and so I would do... Oh, I don't know. I, I probably, I started looking at probably 50% of the time I would go out, I would sane bugs and try to get them intact, right? But that was the big thing about the cripples is that it it just, just walked outside to see if there's any fish rising. Oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, I can hear it. Is that the stream? Yeah, yeah I was going to see if there's any bugs rising. I thought it would be apropos well i'm right my house is right down the river how close are you to the the are you is this the are you on the madison 
Yeah, I'm about 40 feet. Oh, yeah, you're right there. I, was, I just walked out to see if there's any bugs on the water. Perfect. <laughs> I don't know why. Uh, it woke me up a little bit. <laughs> but uh, at any rate, the, so, you know, notice that, and that was, and, and that was back to this, the whole stalking, fishing, and all that's what I brought that up for. It's that, so, had I never took the time to actually look more than the, the fish rising and catching, had I walked away, had I not realized that, that I was having one of the best nights on that hatch I've ever had, actually. I was just catching, I think I had, I don't remember, maybe eight or nine positive hookup fish, right, mm -hmm. in a row. But they were all changing their cadence, and they were, not all, but most of them. And so the observation was the big part of it, like like deer hunting or whatever you do. You observe which way those, you know, yeah. what way do they come at night? Which way do they come in the morning? Where do they bed? You look for things that make your hunt successful. And the same with the fishing. So if it's a dry fly deal, the more you learn, like, like the caddis, are they skating? Are they skittering around? Or are they just laying on the water flat? You know, if mm -hmm. your flies, if they're moving and your flies flat, well, you probably about half as successful as you would have been. And when with the cripples and spinners, realizing that they would get super selective to a specific style of fly. So not only is it a spinner, it's a one wing in the film spinner. And so, hmm. you know, there, there's bugs going over and over and over, and they get to pick which ones they eat. I don't know why they do it, or if they always do it. I don't know that either. They may not always do it. What I know is, is that the, the observation gave me an edge on the person who wasn't observing it. And so that's all part of learning your, you know, your craft. Yep. You know, it's same, like we were talking hunting, it's the same. Yep. You know, you've got your recurve and your longbow guys who are totally traditional, and you got your compound and your crossbow people, you know, and they all, they're at different spaces. They're, they're occupying different areas of their life. You know, and so you tend to see people go, the more they get into it, the more they, they want to know more of the answers, not just, just the not surface stuff. Yeah. Just not when, you know, oh, I caught a fish specifically when you start talking to dry fly people or you're a steelheader, yep. you know, I, I spent 30 years as a steelhead guide and I fished BC for 20 years. I mean, with the best guys in the world. And I fished, one of my favorite guys who became a pretty good friend was Harry Lemire. Yeah. And he had freaking rules. Hmm. <laughs> and I mean, he had rules. <laughs> yeah. And he explained it to you. And because he'd gone through it all, you know, and he wanted to be, it's just a different way to challenge yourself. Now, you know, you don't have to dive into that and you start, you just want to. But the more you learn, the quicker you ascend to, you know, a, becoming a better angler. Mm -hmm. So the more you observe and the more you challenge yourself, not just to get lucky and throw a fly out. Hence the fact that there's how many thousands of flies now. Oh, yeah. Every fly out there is your idea, Dave's idea of that Gallup's fly sucks <laughs> and I'll make it better. Better. You know? And so that's why we have, or, or like me, I mean, there's been more fish caught on an elk hair caddis than all my flies combined probably. Oh yeah. I didn't do well with it. So I tried to make it better and it wasn't a slap in the face to the, to El Troth. It had nothing to do with that. Yeah. You just, I, and then, so you look at my flies and there's an adaptation. You look at the Adams fly. That's why I brought it up originally. Mm -hmm. The Adams fly, everything's an adaptation. Any parachute, you know, is an adaptation of the parachute atoms. Yep. Or maybe it was the Robert Shell Drake. I don't know. Sure. They're both parachutes. Yep, they're all parachutes. And the Robert Shell Drake was a parachute in 1940. Wow. And so, so, yeah. I mean, we're all just tweaking, trying to make ourselves better and our flies better, you know. Yeah. It's just, it's part of the whole deal. It's just, I don't know. Um, that's good. No, I, I, I think um, I think that's probably a good place to leave, uh, you know, maybe some of the dry fly stuff until maybe next time, you know, we chat. I, I did want to dig into, you know, we didn't talk much on that last time about your 
what you have going with you, kind of your lodge and stuff. Can you just describe, I'm not sure with the slide in, do, do you uh, like have a program over there? Do you want to talk about that a little bit? And then you also have something going on in the Bahamas, right? Oh yeah. The slide, well, I don't have any, the slides, just the slide. I mean, we got the shop, our online business and the lodging and all that stuff, uh, which I think most people have seen or it's all online, the slide okay. Yeah. But, and then the Abaco deal, which is, uh, uh, well, it's the the Abaco deal didn't do so well this year, right? Because we were shut down. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think I had, I think I had, I either had three guys for four days or four guys for three days. <laughs> uh, <laughs> wow. Had to, yeah, we're on the southeast end of Abaco on Sandy Point, and uh, I just got into that a couple of years ago with my neighbor Kip Webb, and we bought uh, Ricardo Burrows Lodge, which is the uh, Rickman Lodge, which has been there, that was there like 20 years ago. And we bought that. Ricardo's still our head guy, and Monique, his wife, still the general manager of the place. But uh, we went in and did that, you know, started that two years ago to get it all brought up to brand new and shiny, clean, remodeled, re gut and did everything there. It's 100% brand new, and then we got shut down. Yeah, wow. So, I actually haven't seen it since the final paint job on the remodels. Hmm. We, t- we took the, the hurricane did not hit us. It hit Marsh Harbor north of us and just destroyed that. It was awful. I mean, yeah. It was just tragic to go through that. It's, yeah. I just can't even describe it. But but our end didn't get hit. And so, you know, it was a, the for us, it gave us more time. We just decided to bring it back to its original form. So we... We got it head to toe, roofs to septics and everything in between. And so hmm. we had all the bathrooms, rem- you know, everything in it. Come yep. to the kitchen, everything's done. And I haven't seen it. Oh, I mean, wow. <laughs> are you planning, are you going to be planning a trip out there? Or after, I guess oh, yeah, as soon as still. I can. I mean, I saw it through, I was there through all this. I just didn't get to see the final. Like, we, we had it repainted again. We had it painted the year before, too. And then Hurricane kind of Sam blasted that away for us. Oh, wow. But, uh, so I've seen it through everything except the final, like here, it, we're finally done. Right. It's all, you know, I, I've been back and forth, you know, during all of it and just down fishing and stuff. But, uh, so, uh, <laughs> so now I'm just kind of yeah, you're hanging. waiting to go down. I mean, I can go as soon as I don't have to stay for two weeks, I'll fly down to see everything and oh, yeah. see everybody. But yeah, that's going to be really fun. Cool. That'll be our winter, winter deal. And awesome, but yeah, see how it goes. Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll try to find. And that's it. all. That's all on my website too. That's, that's all there. It's it's Gallup Sandy Point Lodge and yep. Uh, which uh, and it's and a lot of people are listening if they're saltwater have probably been there because yeah. uh, Ricardo was a he's a really famous guy down there and super individual his whole cool. family and so uh, yeah, a lot of people have probably been there before. Perfect. But that's yeah. the new winter gig if it uh if we can ever fly come down out. there again. Yeah, if we can ever come out of this uh hopefully yeah. hopefully soon. And the, and the other thing I think I mentioned it before we started we did that fly tying contest oh, last yeah. year called Kill the Coronavirus. That's right. Which was massively successful. Can and, you find that? Popular. Is there a can we find the videos of that are out there? If yeah, it's on YouTube and it's also on Instagram if you go to our Instagram page and uh, but you know, we did that as a, just as a monotony breaker last year and just to kind of lighten the load here of everybody. And sure. we had, I don't remember almost every fly time. I mean, South Africa, Europe, I mean, tons of European flight. We had to actually do a start a new category. Some of the European cats couldn't get here on time. So we decided to do it again. And we, you know, we gave every category, it was, we just gave prize like two hundred and fifty dollar mm-hmm. gift certificates and stuff like that. And the grand prize winner got a presentation reason Renzetti or a fly rod or something. And it had so much we I don't think we had if we had two hundred people a day in the shop, a hundred and ninety people mentioned it. And and the hundreds and hundreds of email letters right and saying thank you, you know, gave us something to do besides sit here and watch T V and so we decided, and then the guys from Corona, we call it kill the Corona and not the COVID no. and, and kill the coronavirus. And, uh, we had, you know, the 
beer on the table right. with Coronas. And then the rep from Corona come in. He goes, you know, Corona would have backed this. I don't know, there were yeah. millions of views on it. It was unbelievable. Because people were just share. It was just a blast. And so, because I mean, so they, we're doing it again this year. Starting, we're going to announce it uh, November first. Oh, wow. And so we're going to have five categories. We haven't complete. We're going to add some. We might just make them more restrictive. Like caddis will be a caddis larva or whatever caddis anything, but because we had flies all over the board, right? Hmm. Just send in your your best terrestrial. And we get 200 of them. And so then we judge them and then announce it. it oh, was I see. So, absolute... people, so people are sending in, they're physically sending in their yep. flies. Yep. You get 45 days. It'll, it'll, it'll be 45 days from the first one, which is November 1st. Five of us judge it, and we all pick the top 10. This year we're going to have a youth category. Uh, we're going to have top three flies. And then the grand prize winner the one whoever wins the overall gets a contract with MFC, so they're immediately oh, cool. a national, and their and their flies can be on the cover of the magazine, uh, you know, of their catalog. It's it's super That's awesome. cool. That's awesome. Yeah, and it's it's just a fun thing. There's no real, you know, it's not like you win. Oh yeah. Oh, that's that's probably cool. well, you know, what's it going to be bucks. once we if you keep doing this you know once the coronavirus is gone are you going to keep it keep the name kill the coronavirus in years years from now i don't know maybe <laughs> I, I, we'll kill do the something I, I yeah just it was we had one guy send in the 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 covid the molecule that was you got to see the fly it was unbelievable oh, wow. it was also it was incredible but i mean we had all kind of the guy who won it with the coolest fly, it was a damselfly or a dragonfly eating a damselfly, mirror image top, and you flip it over, you can't tell which side's right and which wrong. It was so cool. That's I mean, awesome. I've never seen it. Uh, but we'll probably keep, depending on how this year goes, if it's just as successful as me, because we had a, I mean, 100% positive. Not, you know, just, they were just, it was fun. There's not, it's not like there's a bunch of money in it or anything. It's just, uh, it's just fun. Right. Yeah. Yeah, <clears throat> so, it's, it's just bringing, yeah, we'll see. Bringing, uh, you know, a community, you know, that's obviously a big part you've got, I think you got like 35,000 people on your following you on YouTube. Right. So you've got, yeah. you've got a, you've got a good sized community out there of, of fly and mostly you're doing flight tying stuff mostly on, on your YouTube still. Uh, we do we do a little of everything. We did last year was mostly flight tanks. It was so damn cold we didn't get out much. Yeah. Uh, this year, we're we're, you know, last year with the the virus hitting in the winter and it, it was a stifling. But yeah, we're gonna do a lot. Uh, we're gonna do more fishing this year. Oh, cool. More technique on water. Uh, there'll always be a lot of tying because that's a yeah. that's a big part of it. But. Uh, we're going to do, I'll be on the white. I'm going to do more video on the white again this winter. Oh, cool. Any dry fly stuff? No, it'll all be, it'll all be streamer yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah. You're pretty much still, that's, and, your, that's your niche. And then, of course, we'll do stuff down in uh, Brian Fletching from Mad River Outfitters, a buddy of mine. And uh, we did a bunch of stuff for down in the Bahamas, but then nobody could fly, so we didn't do that. We've already shot some of that, but we'll have a bunch of, we're trying to make it more diverse. We're trying to get ideas. You run out of ideas. Yeah. And so. <laughs> that's right. Well, this... A lot of us getting ideas from people out there, so. Yeah, that's it. That's it. Cool. All right, Kelly. Well, this is, uh, you know, we've had another fun one here. Uh, I've enjoyed it for sure. Um, Me too, man. Yeah. We'll, we'll uh, keep you, maybe we can keep you on, uh, do a, do another segment in a couple of years or may, maybe sooner. Love I'm not you. sure. Last time we did, I think we talked about doing this again and I didn't think it was going to take two years or whatever it was to get you back, <laughs> but it, it's, uh, it's great to have you on and I'll, I'll, I'll keep in touch and throw a bunch of links in the show notes. Appreciate it, man. All right. Thanks have a lot. A great one. All right. See you. So there you go. If you want to find all the show notes with all the links we covered, just go to wetflyswing.com slash 167. If you've been listening uh, to this uh, show today and, and you're still listening, you should hopefully have enough, enough energy to share this episode with one other person that you think could use a little uh, dry fly knowledge. Press pause, click over to the website, copy the link, and text it to one other person right now. You might be jogging. You might be uh, running. Maybe you're on the river, or maybe you are in the car. So um, it might not be possible to share it right now, but uh, just remember that if you can, share it this week or when you get back into town. 
or if you get back from your run. Um, I definitely have not been running lately and I feel kind of like crap. So I think I need to make an effort tomorrow. Uh, it was raining today, so that's my excuse. It was raining really hard and I was uh, kind of weak. So, but tomorrow I'm doing it. I'm definitely going for it. So, um, so there's that. But I want to thank you again today for stopping by to check out the show. I'm looking forward to catching up with you soon. Hope to maybe see you online or on the river. <laughs>